Okay, welcome everybody to a grammar class. We're doing grammar today and we're doing some very difficult grammar. It's called complex gerunds, participles and infinitives. Now I actually have three other videos on exactly the same theme, but I'm not very happy with them, although they still are on my channel and you can go and find them and have a look at them, have a watch of them if you're interested. Um, but I make two mistakes on those three, three lessons. Mistake number one, I use a dangling participle. It's obviously not a mistake I'm very proud of, um, but I will leave it there to show everybody that uh, certainly these lessons do have the odd occasional mistake in them. Um, and so uh, dangling participles are not allowed. And if you want more information about dangling participles, there's loads online. But you can also look, you can also watch the lesson that I've made on dangling participles. And as you can imagine, I actually made that video before I made the lesson on dangling participles. Um, the second mistake that I make is I call a gerund um, a participle. And I also say it's subject when it's certainly not the subject of the sentence. So again, I'm not very pleased with myself for making that mistake. But again, I made the video before I had a long look at exactly what it means to be a gerund and exactly what it means to be a participle. And recently I've been, well, over the last few years, I've been doing a lot of work with gerunds and participles. And so I'm a little bit more familiar with exactly what a gerund and what a participle is. But if you want to know, learn more about gerunds and participles, please have a look at some of my videos on that, that particular topic, because I've already done quite a few lessons on it. Now, what are we doing here? Well, take a modal verb like must or can or could or would or should. And what you'll notice is you have at least six different options of how you can use the verb after the modal verb. Although I would agree that this particular option, um, this one in particular, yeah, this particular option is rare. And this one's pretty rare as well. Um, but let's have a look. If we say um, something like I must, yeah, you can say, or he must. He must be French. Yeah, you can make that deduction. You can say he must be French. Maybe he has a French accent and you say he must be French. His accent gives him away. So he must be French. This would be the simple form after the modal verb. But we could also say something like, um, where is Jack? I don't know. He must be playing tennis because he told me something about that or he... Uh, yeah, he told me about that yesterday. So where's Jack? He must be playing tennis. Now, this would be the continuous form after the modal verb. Yeah, I could use this in a million different ways. It's actually quite easy to use this one. If you just think about what somebody is doing now and say, oh, he must be playing tennis. He might be writing a letter. He could be talking to his mum on the phone. Anything like that will work. And you've got be and the continuous form. Now, if we use these deductions in the past and say something like, where was Jack yesterday? Um, I came to his house and he wasn't at home. You might say he must have been at his mother's. Yeah, you might say he must have um, he must have gone out. He must have been in the bath, something like that. Or he might have been in the bath or he could have been in the bath. You can use other modal verbs as well. But you could even use the perfect continuous form. You could say he might have been playing tennis. If you mean he might have been in the middle of playing tennis. Or you can say he might have been sleeping. If you mean that he was in the middle of sleeping at the moment when you knocked on the door. So there are those forms as well. And I think students very often forget that or they very rarely use them. And I understand this is a complex form. And um, my advice for using any difficult grammar is to speak more slowly. If you speak more slowly, you'll be able to use more difficult grammar. It's a really widespread myth that speaking quickly shows some kind of skill. It doesn't. It shows that you're nervous, that you're emotional, that you have a lot to get off your chest, but it doesn't show great skill with language. So please slow down and you will be able to use all of this complex grammar and people will 
value your language more highly. They'll, they'll think that you're speaking in a really, you know, good way. And so uh, please slow down. Um, now there are two passive forms as well. You might say something like, um, the test must be done, must be finished by the end of the lesson. Yeah, it must be done, it must be finished. That would be passive simple. But if we're talking about yesterday, we could put it into perfect passive and say something like the test must have been finished by three o'clock because I saw all of the kids coming out at five past three. Yeah, so the, the test must have been finished, the exams must have been completed by three o'clock because I saw the kids coming out. And that would be a modal deduction in the past and also a passive form. So we've got all of those different forms for modal verbs. However, we do have all of those different forms for two plus infinitive and for gerund and for perfect participle. Now, in the previous few lessons, I mixed up these two, the gerund and the participle. But the general idea is that the participle is always an adjective and the gerund is always a noun. Although we do misuse our gerunds and participles all the time in everyday speech. And I think I like to blame uh, everybody else, basically, for me, for my making that mistake. You notice for my making, not for me making. And this is the topic of gerundoff participle. To be honest, I wasn't taught any grammar at school. I certainly didn't know what a gerund or a participle was. We weren't taught this at school and we weren't taught any of this at university. It doesn't matter if you studied English. I think if you studied linguistics, maybe you came across gerunds and participles. Perhaps you did. Um, you might have come across gerunds and participles. Um, but it's rare that I meet somebody who has come across gerunds and participles who's English. It's incredibly rare and I actually do a lot of lessons with native speakers and you know usually this is the hardest thing that we do gerunds or participles and it's because we misuse them in everyday speech. Anyway um, lecture finished let's get on to the two plus infinitive gerund and participle. So when do we use these in perfect forms and I'm really just looking at these two here because these are the two perfect forms have done and have been doing and this is the passive passive perfect form have been done. So we're just looking at those three. Now two plus infinitive we can use after adjectives. We can say I was delighted to have met him before or he was angry not to have been informed earlier. Notice the perf perfect passive there. That's passive, to have been informed. Now, we use, we use these forms because there are adjectives here, delighted and angry. And after adjectives, we can use these perfect forms. Now, I've got to be honest with you and say that most English people speak very quickly and they're not making an effort to use really beautiful language. They're not making an effort to use difficult grammar or difficult vocabulary and therefore they don't often use these two forms but they do recognise them and you will hear certain English speakers using these forms after adjectives and usually they're the English speakers that know a lot of grammar or know a lot of vocabulary or really take a pleasure in speaking the language well. Um, so if you slow down, you'll be able to do this too. You can use a, a, a perfect form, but there's nothing wrong with saying, I was delighted to meet him. Yeah, I think with the word before, to have met sounds better because it's earlier. But um, you will hear English speakers saying, I, I was delighted to meet him. I was angry not to be informed. But put it in passive, and uh, sorry, put it in perfect tense and it does sound very nice. I was angry not to have been informed at an earlier time and it does, it sounds good. Um, so firstly you can use the perfect infinitive after adjectives although you don't have to but I want to encourage you to give it a try and the reason is you will sound intelligent, I promise. So please do, do try to activate this grammar, it's hard but if you slow down you can do it. Now, secondly, after certain verbs, we use perfect two plus infinitive. Now, which verbs? Well, I've put them over here, haven't I? Because I couldn't fit them over here. So you need to look at this side of the board. Claim, seem, appear, promise, expect, hope, need, pretend. 
would like, would hate, would love, would prefer. Notice they're all two plus infinitive verbs anyway. That's the first thing to notice. But with these ones, we very often see the perfect two plus infinitive form. So with these ones, you can very often use them. Yeah, and I, I suggest that you start using this grammar with these verbs first. So I expect to have finished by the end of the week. Notice that we've got the time expression by plus time expression. And we very often teach future perfect with this by plus time expression. By the end of the week, I will have finished, yeah? Now, it's the same goes for this perfect two plus infinitive. We very often use it with that time expression, by and then time expression. So by next month, I promise to have done the project. By the end of the year, I expect to have earned a million pounds. Um, or, or something like, uh, I can't think of any ones with by now. Uh, by, the, by the end of the month, I would like to, I would like to have finished my next book. Yeah, something like that. So all of these work very well with by and the time expression. That's something to remember. Um, I pretended not to have received the email. Here, pretend is being used. It's one of our verbs, it's over here. And we could put that with a perfect form. I pretended to have received the email. Or I pretended, um, I pretended not to have been informed. It works as well, not to have been informed. And then we've got a perfect passive uh, form, not to have been informed. Okay, so we use perfect two plus infinitive after adjectives, after certain verbs, and also as subject. But I want to talk about that at the end, because both gerund and two plus infinitive can be used as subject. Let's do, do, talk about gerunds. We use gerunds after prepositions. Now immediately some of you will realise that this is the same as the gerunds and two plus infinitive basic lesson, which is that use gerunds after prepositions and use two plus infinitive after adjectives. Some of you will already realise that. Um, and we do use gerunds after certain verbs as well, which brings us down to this one. Um, because there's a lot of overlap. You have actually already learnt a lot of this grammar. And so take a look at these examples. They thanked me for having helped. Yeah, they thank thanked me for having helped them. Or he confessed to having stolen the money. Now again, you can say he confessed to stealing the money. You can use the simple form. But I want to encourage you to use the perfect form. It sounds very nice. And if you want to sound very clever and uh, as though you use, if you want to sound um, uh, like a very high level English speaker, then please use these perfect forms. He confessed to having stolen the money. I mean, practice using them first. And the more that you practice, the easier it will get. He got on the train without having bought a ticket. Yeah, you can say without buying a ticket, but without having bought a ticket, it sounds very nice. Please use it. And also after gerund verbs, we use perfect gerund. Makes sense, right? These are gerund verbs. So regret is a gerund verb. We regret not having informed you earlier. Yeah, we regret not having sent you an email. We regret not having spoken to your brother. It could be anything. But after regret, if it's something before the regret, and it usually is, you can use a perfect gerund. Okay, I deny having received the email. Yeah, or he denied having killed the man. Yeah, you can say he denied killing the man, but having killed sounds really nice. So please, why not use it? Um, now, um, perfect participles. This is something that I made a mistake with in the previous class. Having been born in the UK, I'm obviously a native. Now here we've got a perfect passive participle. OK, it's passive because I was born. That's always passive, isn't it? And this is why I think it's crazy that in some grammar guides I read, never use the passive. You try saying I was born in the active and you'll see how that's definitely not the case. Sometimes you need the passive. So this is a participle because the having been born describes the subject of the main clause. And notice I haven't put a dangling participle in here. I almost did. Again, it's a very easy mistake to make. But 
I changed it to make sure I got I. The subject of the main clause must be the one who the participle describes, otherwise you've got a dangling participle. So having been born in the UK, I'm obviously a native, but there's not really much wrong with saying, born in the UK, I'm obviously a native. You can say that too, but please use the perfect form, why not? And having not been introduced, I had no idea what his name was. Again, it's pa perfect, it's a participle, and it's passive. So all of this describes the subject of the main clause. Um, so it's not the subject itself. This is what the mistake I made. I called that the subject in the other video. I'm sorry, that's totally wrong. This is describing the subject of the main clause and it's actually a participle phrase. I'm not gonna call it a clause because it doesn't have a subject and a verb. It's a participle phrase. Okay, so participles can also go into these forms, the perfect forms. Okay, um, now let's come, oh, and of course you can get simple gerunds in continuous. You can say, uh, um, he seem, at the moment he seems to be working. Yeah, something like that. Um, maybe at the moment he seems to be, sounds a bit weird. Um, at the moment um, he seems to be making progress, something like that. Uh, so you can use it in continuous form as well. It doesn't have to be imperfect. They're also complex forms. Um, and we can also use them in the simple passive as well, be done. Um, it seems to be done or it seems to have been done. They're both okay. Okay, so we've done perfect participles. Lastly, as subject, um, we can use either a perfect gerund or a perfect two plus infinitive as subject. But as somebody once wrote under one of my videos, and I liked this comment, um, gerunds look backwards and two plus infinitives look forwards. And it's very, it, it's really quite true that we often use gerunds to refer to things in the past. I, did, do you remember um, drinking your first beer? Do you remember smoking your first cigarette? You're going back to the past, but uh, two plus infinitives very often are about future things. So did you remember to lock the door? To lock the door is after you. Did you remember and then lock the door? So in that sense, that's quite a good rule to remember. Um, but have a look at these two sentences. Having seen maybe Pink Floyd, let's say, I think everybody knows them. Having seen Pink Floyd live was fantastic. Or to have seen Pink Floyd live would have been great. Now, I've never seen Pink Floyd live, unfortunately, so I'd have to say the second one. I'd have to say to have seen Pink Floyd live would have been great, but uh, unfortunately, I never bought a ticket. And I regret not having bought a ticket. Yeah, something like that. Um, but if you have seen them live, you could say having seen Pink Floyd live was fantastic. Yeah, and so you could use the gerund if it really did happen. The two plus infinitive to me very often sounds more hypothetical. And especially here, to have seen them live would have been great. This is the same as if I had seen them live, it would have been great. So it's the same as third conditional. But the real take home here from all of this stuff, and I do appreciate that it's really complicated, and I certainly appreciate that there are no exercises online, or very few, I've found free. Um, and there are a couple of mistakes in one of them. So if anybody knows where there are exercises on this grammar online, put them under the video, that would be fantastic. Yeah, please put, the, put any links under the video to anything that deals with complex gerunds and infinitives because I really can't find exercises. And even grammar books, the advanced grammar book by Hewings that everybody knows about, it's the level above Murphy. The intermediate book Murphy certainly doesn't have any of this in it. Um, Hewings book doesn't really have, or it has very, very little on this particular piece of grammar. So if anybody out there can recommend a link or a book that actually deals with this grammar, um, I'd, I'd be delighted if you could share it with us, yeah? Because that, that would be great. Um, I might actually write some of my own exercises to, to uh, have a look at this grammar because it's very rare that you see anybody dealing with this grammar. I suppose it's because it's rather difficult. But still, you can put it into your speech if you slow down. And that really is what I want everybody to take home from today. Slowing down is a good way 
to improve your English or to improve any of your languages. Maybe you have some other languages under your belt. You probably got your native language under your belt. And if you want to speak your native language better, I guarantee you will as long as you slow down. If you take time to think about how you make your sentences and what kind of sentences you want to include in your speech, you'll be able to, to, to use sentences much better. Um, okay, hello to Essex. I'm also in Essex, John. Hello. <laughs> so uh, thanks everybody for watching. If anybody would like to buy a book, I've got one around here somewhere that I, wanna, uh, that I want you all to buy. I'm at, actually in the middle um, this is the book I'm selling, Visual Phrasal Verbs. It's about phrasal verbs and you can get it for £20 on Amazon or you can buy it as a PDF colour from the website. Um, and uh, I'm writing a grammar book at the moment that is actually aimed at natives. Somebody just asked, do you teach GCSE English? Um, this is aimed at anybody teaching or studying GCSE English or A-level English or anybody else who wants to just improve their English. It will go through nouns, then verbs, then adjectives, then adverbs. It will go through all the punctuation marks and it will speak a lot about parallel structure and different ways, different methods, different techniques that you can use to improve your sentences. Okay, thanks everybody for watching. I hope to see you all soon.